Amen. Well, it's great to see you. Good to have you here with us. God is good. Amen. <clears throat> well, we want to continue worshiping with our giving today. How many of you know that giving is worship? Giving is also an act of love. For God so loved the world that he gave. And as he gave, he knew that by giving his sons, that more sons were going to be brought into glory. And the same principle applies. We know that as we give to God, you can't outgive God. And the Bible promises us a return of 30, 60, and 100 fold. So we thank God for his faithfulness today. How many of you can testify that God is more faithful than we are? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Just if you, I think you turn me down just a bit. Amen. So let's just pray. Hold your offering in your hand. We're going to bless it today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give, and we thank you that as we give, there's a multiplication that's coming. Lord, we don't give to be blessed. We give to be obedient, but we thank you that through our obedience, the blessing is there. So as we give today, Lord, we're thanking you in advance for the promise of more than enough, and sufficiency for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead, girls. Thank you. I do want to uh, make a couple quick announcements. Uh, Jesse, as he announced uh, about pastor appreciation, I didn't pay him to say that. Uh, but I, w I do want to say that it, it would be impossible to do any of this without you all. Uh, the church is not just the pastor, the church is the people, and we appreciate and love each and every one of you. Each one of you adds such a different dynamic to uh, the life of our church, and we appreciate you being here, and we love you, and thank you for your faithfulness and, and your generosity. Uh, <coughs> along with that, it, it would be impossible to, to do, to, it would be impossible to do what we do without uh, Garrett and Emily, they've been with us since the very beginning, and I can't tell them or you how much we appreciate their faithfulness um, and their willingness to serve. Emily does a great job with the kids every Sunday and Wednesday, and then now they've been going out into the community and evangelizing, and our kids are learning so much. I don't know if you know this, but our kids are powerfully prophetic, and uh, if you have a child that that uh, attends our children's church here, you really need to sit them down sometime and have them prophesy over you. It would be good. Uh, we have kids that are interpreting dreams, kids that are seeing healing, and uh, in large part that's due to Emily's work with them. So we appreciate her and Garrett, and uh, we have a little gift for them. I'm not going that's that's already there, and uh, and also it would uh, not be good if I didn't mention Jesse. He's only been here with us for a short time, but he's added so much uh, to the life of our church and has taken a great burden off of my shoulders in many ways. And uh, we're so blessed and honored that God uh, chose to send him in our direction. So we appreciate uh, Jesse as well. So can we just show the Dotsons and Jesse our appreciation today and thank them? Thank you, guys. <clears throat> We love you, and uh, amen. So, happy pastor appreciation. Uh, also, I, on a down note, a little downside here, a little bad news. I lost the chili cook-off on Wednesday. I'm still recovering from my loss, so bear with me. But, uh, you know, I was talking to Danny, our drummer, today before church, and I think he hit the nail on the head. He said, you know, you won last year and they had it against you. The odds were stacked against you. And uh, that's what I believe happened. Uh, but our winner was Kayla. So congratulations to Kayla who won. Yep, good job. She'd been practicing all year, coming up with all different recipes. But she finally pulled off a win, so we'll let her keep the medal for now, and we'll have to wait till next year. 
Uh, also, got a lot of announcements apparently. Uh, this coming Saturday, the 24th, we're going to have a work day here at the church. If you can help us out, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're actually in the final stages of buying the building. Uh, so this should happen hopefully uh, October, mid-November sometime. We're just waiting on a closing date at this point. Uh, so as soon as we close on the building, we've got a lot of projects that we want to accomplish here. Uh, the first thing is those doors at the front entrance are going because I hate them, and I hope that you share my hatred for them. Um, so we've got some sprucing up to do. There's some yard work and things. So if you can come, we're going to be here between 10 and 5. So you don't have to come at 10 if you've got a couple hours in the afternoon. Uh, I know hunting season is upon us. Uh, but if you can spare an hour or two hours, we've got some walls that need wiped down, some floors that need swept, and uh, some outdoor projects that we want to get done. Um, and also with that, if you have anything that you can bring with you, uh, such as weed eaters, uh, leaf blowers, tarps, um, mops, rags, sweepers, just bring it with you when you come and we'll put it to work. Uh, so that's this coming Saturday between 10 and 5. 10 and 5. All right. Is that it? I think so. All right. Kids, you guys can head out. Thank you. Good job. We love the kids. Sometimes churches, uh, messages, um, I feel from having preached over the last few years, sometimes it seems like messages are directed toward people in the sense that the Lord just wants to minister and uh, bring some healing, revelation, deliverance. Uh, but then there's other times where it seems like messages are directed to the corporate body uh, to the body of Christ at large. And today I feel like that's uh, where we're at with this message. And I want to talk to you today about the purpose of signs and wonders. We talked, we sang a little bit about it this morning. God is still a miracle working God. Amen. He still raises the dead, even though people may not believe it, he does. Uh, he still performs miracles. He still does mighty things. He still heals the sick, makes the lame to walk, and the blind to see. Amen? And that's the God that we believe in. That's the God that we were singing to this morning. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to just introduce us to you, if I can, for a moment. Some of you have been here with us for a long time, and some of you have been here with us for a short time. Some of you, this may be your first time here today, but uh, Krista and I grew up in the Assemblies of God together, not at the same church, but in the same denomination. Uh, so I grew up Pentecostal. My grandfather on my mom's side was actually a Southern Baptist pastor, so I have some of that experience in me as well. But at an early age, God began to, uh, began to have experiences with the Holy Spirit and uh, began to discover how powerful the Holy Spirit is and how he wants to move through us. And uh, growing up, I would probably have identified myself as Pentecostal. And Pentecostal basically means we're the ones who look at the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and everything that happened there. And, 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 and we recognize that that is also a part of our life. It wasn't just for a certain period of time or a certain group of people thousands of years ago. It was meant to continue on and on. Just as Paul said when he stood up before the crowd uh, and, and quoted from the prophet Joel saying, uh, this is that which the Lord had promised that your sons and daughters would have visions, your old men would have dreams, and so on and so forth. But then he goes on to say that this promise is for you your children, and all of those who are far off, which means it was never supposed to end. Religion has told us that it ended, but the Bible declares that it was 
to continue on from one generation to the next. And I believe as it continued on from generation to gen generation, it was actually supposed to get bigger and not decrease, to increase as the kingdom of God always does from faith to faith and glory to glory. It's an ever increasing kingdom. Pentecostal. And, and, and then as I kind of got a little older, I, 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 I began to become attached to some what we would consider charismatics. Now, there's not a big difference between Pentecostal and charismatics. There are some. Uh, but charismatic, they get their name from the word charisma, which comes directly from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. That's the charisma, the charis of God, the gifts of grace. And charismatics lean uh, more towards the gift of the Spirit. In other words, when I was growing up as a Pentecostal, they wanted us to get saved, right? Receive Jesus, and then get baptized in the Holy Spirit, which in Pentecostal circles that I grew up in meant speak in tongues. Uh, so get saved, speak in tongues, and then you're good. You're a Pentecostal. But how many of you know, like, there's, a, like, you got to keep, get, like, there's more. <laughs> All right, this is how I grew up. This is my understanding. Yours may have been a little bit different, but once you were baptized, uh, or, you know, saved, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, I even remember as a child, they took us behind the puppet stage, because that's where the Holy Spirit moved, I guess. I don't know, behind the puppet stage, a little weird. Took us behind the puppet stage because they wanted us to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, so we go back there, and the lady says, Now repeat after me. Untie my bow tie, tie my bow tie. Who stole my Honda? So on. Yeah, that's the truth. I know. It's a little weird. And, and the idea was to get us to start saying these syllables and then hopefully the Holy Spirit would come. Now, I've just confused a whole lot of you. So I'm sorry. And I just made Pentecostalism look really bad. <laughs> uh, but how many of you know, those of you who are filled with the Holy Spirit and have your prayer language, how many of you know that like when it comes, you do not you, you don't fake it? Like, it's not faked. It's real reality. Uh, and so I, I began to learn, you know, more about the charismatic circles. And, and their focus is more on the emphasis of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So these are focused on the gifts of healing, the gifts of faith, the gift of miracles. And in reality, what I've come to the conclusion in my own personal life is I'm not a Pentecostal. I'm not a charismatic. I am a Spirit-filled believer. And because this Holy Spirit lives in me, everything that the Bible says uh, about the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the workings of the Holy Spirit, because He lives inside of me, I have access to everything that's inside of Him. And this is what I believe that the church, it, it, we're, that we're coming to this place where the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we've seen them throughout the last uh, couple of decades, the uh, last couple hundred years, we've seen the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate. We've seen the church come awake even more to the reality of the moving of the Holy Spirit and what it is that the Holy Spirit is doing through us and in us and in the church. Uh, but what I want to do today is to bring some awareness to you that the Holy Spirit comes upon us, not so that we get goosebumps and not so that we feel good, not so that we can say I speak in tongues and not so I can say I saw somebody healed over here. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us because God wants to bring a transforming power to you so that you can go out and change the world around you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not for you. Yes, they flow through you. And yes, God uses you. And yes, it feels good. And oh man, there's nothing, there's nothing like it. But in reality, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to you for others. So get your eyes off of you for a minute and get your eyes onto others. And when you get your eyes onto others, you'll be surprised how much more the Holy Spirit actually wants to use you. Because it becomes less about you and more about them and much more about Him. God, flow through me. Use me to touch other people around me. And, and, and I've come to this conclusion that we must, as we sang this morning, we must see a move of God. Not just corporately, but in our own individual lives. As Garrett instructed us today, come and see. 
In other words, have your own moment with the Lord. Have your own experience with God. And I believe that the church in America is coming to this place where we are now having to rely more on the person of the Holy Spirit. Because for far too long, it's just become about entertainment. It's become about programs. It's, it's become about how can you gather so many people when our emphasis all the while should be and always should be how can we attract the presence of God? Because if you attract His presence, I promise you, the end result is that you also attract people. Everywhere that Jesus went, multitudes followed Him because they wanted to be where Jesus was. I don't want you to want to be where Pastor Ken is. I want you to want to be where Jesus is. I want Jesus to be in this place because, listen, Pastor Ken has his limits and they're only so far. They're about this far. And once I reach that point, if God doesn't make up the rest, listen, it's like it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. I want it to happen. I really want it to happen. But it just ends right here. And God has to make up the rest. And thankfully, most of the time, he does because he's good and he's good to me and he's faithful. And he's very gracious. So I thank him for that. But see, in Mark chapter 16, if someone would do me a quick favor and shut the back door there, just because at some point in time the kids are going to. We don't expect kids to, you know, always be quiet in church. Listen to what Jesus says. This is the words of Jesus. And he says in Mark 16, verse 17, we'll just go to 15. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved and he who does not believe will be condemned. And then in verse 17, he says, and these signs will follow the Pentecostals. Isn't that what? Oh, it doesn't say. These signs will follow the charismatics, is it? No. These signs will only follow the 12 apostles for all of time. He says, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. How many of you know we need some believers that know how to cast out some demons because we've got a lot of demons floating around, especially in this day and age that we're living in, and they need to be cast out. Amen? They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, we don't have any serpents here. There's, we're not, you know, Pentecostals in West Virginia, especially, you know, you say we're Pentecostal in West Virginia. They're like, where's the snakes? <laughs> that's a little, that's like, that's just stupid. That's the spirit of stupidity. Actually, if you read about Paul on the Isle of Malta, this is where they will take up deadly serpents and they will not be harmed. That's where it comes into effect when Paul is crashed on the Isle of Malta and he puts his hand into the bundle of sticks and the viper attaches itself, fastens itself to his hand. The islanders wait for him to drop dead and when he doesn't drop dead, they think he's a god. It's not because Paul is a god, it's because the god that Paul serves lives inside of him. And the power of the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is more powerful than any force on earth. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. See, Jesus is talking about you. He's talking about believers. That believers are the agents of transformation in the world around them. That we are the carriers of the signs and the wonders of the kingdom of heaven. That when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we should be the most unusual people on the planet. This is what God, how God describes his people in the Old Testament. You are a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're supposed to be peculiar. 
Come on, Christians, can we say that we've become so normal that we just fit into society and nobody thinks anything differently about us anymore? We've we've wanted to be accepted and loved so much when all the while Jesus continually tells us that we will be hated for his name, that we'll be persecuted for his name. But when somebody, you know, comes against our Christianity, we get our feelings hurt. When Jesus told us it's going to happen, he even goes on to say, uh, you know, a father is going to betray their children, children are going to betray their parents all because of my name. But we are believers and because we are believers, the power of the Holy Spirit rests upon us so that we can bring the transforming agent of God, who is the Holy Spirit, to the world around us. See, the word sign means an unusual occurrence. It means to transcend the common course of nature. When Jesus turns the water into wine, it's a miracle. But how many of you know it's also a sign and a wonder? What is a sign? A sign is something that points you into a direction. A wonder is something that makes you wonder. So when God comes and does a sign and a wonder, it's to point us in his direction. It's so that he he puts a wonder inside of us. How did this happen? How can this occur? Because this is outside of the usual occurrence of the normal force of nature. So how could this have happened unless God did something? See, Jesus' ministry was full of signs and wonders. In fact, crowds would follow him around just to see signs and wonders, some of them. Jesus even said about that generation, they said, you won't believe unless you see a sign and a wonder. And see, you and I as believers, we're not chasing after signs and wonders. This is what, you know, charismatics and Pentecostals are accused of often. Well, you just want to see crazy stuff happen. Listen, we're not supposed to be chasing after him. They're supposed to be chasing after us. These signs follow those that believe. Behind you should be a pathway of signs and wonders. Unusual occurrences by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, you guys all right? See, Jesus' ministry was full of signs and wonders. The water into wine, blind eyes open, Him walking on water, all of these things. Yes, they were miracles. Yes, they were healing. But they are also signs and wonders. They are signs that point us into the direction of a good God. They are wonders that cause us to wonder, how did these things happen? How do these things happen? But it didn't just end with Jesus' ministry. The ministry of signs and wonders continued on into the new Testament church ministry from the very beginning. As soon as the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2, from that point on, all we see and read about is the unusual workings of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Signs and wonders were getting them thrown into jail. Signs and wonders are getting them in trouble. There's a, I, listen, I learned this lesson a long time ago. You, you can get up here and preach about Jesus all day long and heaven and you know good stuff and everybody's just fine with that. But you start producing miracles and signs and wonders and all of a sudden, hold on a second, we have a problem here. <laughs> this is beyond my scope. I don't understand. Listen, you're not supposed to understand. That's why it's called a wonder. The New Testament... In Acts, it says the, how the Holy Spirit worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Listen, every miracle is unusual. Can we agree with that? If it was usual, it wouldn't be a miracle. But, uh, you know, it, it gets into our head. We can't understand it. We can't rationalize it. Can, can we agree God is not rational? He doesn't think the way that we think. We're supposed to be trying to think the way He thinks. God has no common sense. I'm just saying. I mean, have you ever seen a duck-billed platypus? Like, who creates that that has common sense? Makes no sense. It's like God had all these spare parts left up in heaven or something. He's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And 
And he's like, well, wait a second. I'll just, be, oh, here it is. What do you call it? It's a duck-billed platypus. Come on, guys. Are you all right today? Just lighten up. It's all right. It's funny. Like God has no common sense because God's not common. We're common. We want to rationalize everything. We want to bring everything down to our level so we can understand it. Well, you're never going to understand everything about God. It's going to take us all of eternity to understand Him just a little bit more. God is multifaceted. When Job tries to describe how these things transpired in his life, God has to sit him down and say, now, Job, I want you to explain to me something. How is, how is the wind stored up? How is the snow stored up for the winter? How is the rain stored up for the latter rains? And Job can't explain it because Job is not on the same level as God and neither are we. So these signs and these wonders, they, they happen. We don't understand how they happen or uh, where they came from, but we do understand that it is through the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. The working of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer that causes them to demonstrate signs of power when they go into the world and begin to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, signs and wonders were actually given to us as a gift from God so that we would have something in our arsenal to use when we come in contact with the forces of darkness. When we come in contact with those who have been ravaged by the workings of the enemy in their life, just as the Bible says, for this reason, the Son of Man was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. And now God has put His Holy Spirit inside of us so that we could go forth and continue to destroy the works of the enemy in people's lives. So that when oppression comes, when darkness comes, even when sickness comes, there is an answer from heaven and the answer is found in the life of one believer that's full of the Holy Spirit who's willing to go forth and allow God to use him. <laughs> Come on, church. Come on, don't you think it's about time we rise to the occasion? Look at our society. Listen, you can't, I'm telling you, I, oh, dear Lord Jesus, help me. Listen, you can't blame the government for what's happening and what has happened and what has transpired. Judgment begins with the house of God. How do we go from a Christian nation back in the 40s and 50s to what we have now? Because we've been, we've been sitting on the bench, on the sidelines, just allowing the game to be played out before us. And we have thought that it was okay to shrink back. We have thought that it was okay to not be forceful. We thought that it was okay to take the gloves off. But listen, if there's ever a time to put the gloves back on, it's now. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And our, and our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. And those things that are, exist in high places. But the only way to bring those things down is through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. You've got to get in the game. I've got to get in the game. We're in this together. Come on, it's like David. All the Israelites are sitting back and they're watching Goliath with his foul mouth, call down curses upon the people of God. And what are they doing there? They're just standing there. Why? Because they don't think they're powerful enough to do anything about it. But then Daniel, David shows up on the scene and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And a little shepherd boy shows up an entire army of trained men with just a sling and a stone because God was with him. And if God will do it with him, I promise you, he'll do it with you. The giants must come down. The giants have to come down. But giants only come down when the people of God choose to put the stone in the sling and swing it with all their might and trust in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring that thing down to the ground. 
And then we go up and we pick up the sword, which is the word of truth. And we chop the stinking head off of that lion demon. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29. See, these men are put into prison because of the signs and wonders that God is producing through them. And they begin to pray for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may preach your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And what's the point? The point is that the early New Testament church were actually praying for signs and wonders to happen. After they're put into prison because of producing signs and wonders. Because these men know that the way to transform society and transform culture is to give culture a glimpse of what is available to us through the working of the Holy Spirit. And we're not going to stop. We're not going to sit back. We're going to push forward and we're going to do it even more regardless of how much trouble it gets us into. See, signs and wonders in the New Testament are completely different than signs and wonders from the Old Testament. Listen, do you know, you don't know this. Krista hates these glasses. And she has a right to. I'll admit. I've had these glasses for 15 years. It's the truth. The lenses are yellow. They're all scratched up. I mean, they're scratched. But you know, like, I'm getting to that age where I don't like new things. All right. I don't like the change. It's like God has perfected me. I don't need any more. I'm not, I'm done changing. God, I'm done. And we have this conversation a lot, trust me. Uh, but he always wins. <laughs> Uh, I've had these stupid glasses for 15 years. They have fallen apart. We went to a water park last year, and I don't take them off. Like These things do not come off because I can't see without them. And I'm going down the water slide, even though there's a sign right there that says don't take off your glasses before you go down the slide. I'm not going to take them off because I don't want to. And I go down the slide, I come down, I crash, water splashes, and all of a sudden they are in a pool that's about the size of this room, and I'm supposed to find these things. So they turned off the pump. About three lifeguards got in the water because I was not leaving until I got my glasses back. And when they found them, this piece was off. It fell off and it keeps falling off. Anyway, the point is I view the world through these lenses. They're scratched. They are a little discolored, which probably means some of you right now look a little discolored and a little scratchy. It's not because you're ill, it's because that's how I see you. So if I come up to you later and ask you if you're feeling okay, you just need to tell me, check your glasses. All right. But see, I've learned something. God has taught me some things in the last few years. And one of the things that God has taught me is that we also view God through a particular lens. A lens that was given to us as a child, the lens that was given to us as a teenager, a lens that even at times was given to us as an adult, because we've all grown up in different circles and circumstances, different church backgrounds. And I promise you, in a church of this size, I promise you, not all of us agree on everything concerning God and things. And I promise you, I've been around all of you enough to know. And I don't tell the other person what the other person thinks, because we'll figure all that out. <clears throat> At the end. (laughs) But see, what I've learned is that we also view God through a particular lens. James and John viewed God through a lens, and the lens was, Jesus, let us call down fire from heaven on these cities that have rejected you. But Jesus changes their lens and says, no, guys, you can't do that because you don't know what spirit you're of. But in the Old Testament, that's how humanity viewed God through a lens of judgment, through a lens of wrath, and perhaps they had a right to. Because we remember Pharaoh, for instance, 
who held the children of Israel captives as slaves for decades. And when God decides that He's going to bring freedom to His children, to the children of Israel, God has to perform signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against Egypt, in order for Pharaoh to finally relinquish the children of God. Are you with me? And so God brings forth you know, the plagues of, of uh, frogs, the water turning into blood, and then the final straw was the death of the firstborn son. And Pharaoh finally says, I've had enough of these signs, I've had enough of these wonders, take the guys and go. At the same time, there's also a city called Sodom, and God comes down from heaven to examine the wickedness of Sodom. Come on, can you think about this? Sodom was so wicked that God Himself comes down in the form of a man, meets with Abraham and says, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? And God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom because its wickedness has come up before me. And Abraham says, God, would you at least spare Sodom for the sake of 40, for the sake of 30, for the sake of 20, for the sake of 10? And there's not even 10 righteous men in the city of Sodom. And so what does God do? He destroys it. Brimstone, earthquake, fire. And even when Lot and his wife are fleeing from the city, Lot's wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. That's a sign and a wonder. But how many of you understand? It's all destruction. Now we could debate and theologicalize all of that. I don't have time for that. Just painting you a picture of the Old Testament from the New Testament. In the Old Testament, signs and wonders were produced against cities. Judgment came. Signs and wonders. Bad stuff. The judgment of God. In the book of Hebrews, it says how God in latter days spoke to us through the law and the prophets, but in these last days, He has now spoken to us by His Son. And see, we've got to come to a place where the lens that we view God through is cleansed. Where the Spirit of truth guides us into all truth and we see God more clearly than we do right now. The Bible says that now we look in a glass dimly or darkly, but one day we'll view Him face to face. In other words, the view of God that we have right now is not completely clear. But one day, we're going to see Him face to face and we will realize the truth that existed in Him and we will also know the truth, the untruth that existed in us about God. Listen, I grew up in church my whole life and I can promise you, I've probably had to unlearn more than I've actually learned. And by unlearning, I learned. By unlearning, I came to truth. And the thing that I've come to realize with Christians especially is because somebody taught me this. I took it in as truth. And when another form of truth comes, I'm I'm going to defend the truth that I know because I don't want to be wrong. You want to know one of the greatest lessons I learned a long time ago? To learn to be wrong. And it was probably marriage that taught me that. Because, man, I was the firstborn son. I was the firstborn grandkid. Like, I didn't do nothing wrong until I got to be a teenager. I ruled, ruled and reigned. Little Kenny, the king of the Boone household. (laughs) Yeah, Some of you know what I'm talking about. So I come into marriage, and it's like, oh, what are you doing? Like, you don't do that. You can't do this. It's like, You learn. And you learn to be wrong. And you know what? It's okay. It's a good lesson sometimes. I am wrong. And I've learned this about God because there was things I was holding on to. And even still today, there's things that I was holding on to and I had to come to a, a conclusion. God, the things that I thought about you are not right. Because I had an Old Testament lens of God and I thought that God surely was a God of judgment. And when I mess up, God's going to be there to to punish me. God's going to be there to make sure that I don't do that thing again. And and if I'm not careful, God's going to bring down His wrath upon me. So I grew up as a Pentecostal and some of you grew up in a 
church culture where you had a lot of rules, and we had a lot of rules. Women had to have long hair. You weren't allowed to go to the bowling alley. You weren't allowed to play pool. You weren't allowed to uh, go to the movie theater. And some of that stuff is okay. Maybe, I don't know. But there was just rules. And my theology was, if I break a rule, God's going to break me. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that because of what God might do to me. But then I read somewhere in the New Testament not too long ago that says it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. And all the while, I thought, no, I thought it was the judgment of God. And I thought for sure that when people prophesied over California and over Hollywood and they said that destruction is going to come and earthquakes are going to come and hur hurricanes are going to come, I thought for sure that they deserved the wrath of God. And that God would be justified by sending His judgment upon these unholy cities. But then I read somewhere in the New Testament that I love God because He first loved me. That I was a sinner who was deserving of death. I was a sinner who was deserving of the judgment and the wrath of God. But God sent His Son and Jesus became the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. And that through the blood of Jesus, I have complete access to God. And that God's grace and His mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I began to thank God. God, you, you're, you're good. And You love me. And You're not out to punish me. You're not out to get me every time I mess up. I don't deserve Your grace. I don't deserve Your mercy, but yet You extend it to me. See, Sodom was the most wicked city of all the Old Testament, and God comes and destroys the city. Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt. That's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 21, listen to what Jesus says about Sodom. The most wicked city of the entire Old Testament. Sodom. Jesus says in verse 21, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have long repented ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to the heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Listen to this. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. I say it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Come on, there's a day of judgment, but it's not today. Aren't you thankful? Got a few more minutes here. If anybody wants to clean up before the day of judgment comes, the altars are open. I have a little confession time. Come on, you guys get what I'm trying to say? In the Old Testament, the view of God was judgment, wrath. God destroys Sodom. But in the New Testament, what happens? Jesus flips it upside down. So that no longer are signs and wonders done against cities. Now signs and wonders are performed for the benefit of cities. If, if What Jesus is saying, if one believer full of the Holy Spirit would have went into the most wicked city on all the earth and performed the signs and wonders of the kingdom of heaven, if they would have healed the sick, if they would have cast out demons, which there was a lot there that needed to be cast out, if they would have performed signs and wonders and miracles, Sodom itself would have repented and would still be with us to this day. So what is the purpose of God's signs and wonders? I'm telling you this morning, the purpose is to transform the culture and the cities around us. But the problem is, is we just want goosebumps and feel-goods. We want to come to church and have that moment with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we all want that. I want that. I want it for you. But if you leave here and you don't do anything with it, then what good was it? Listen, charismatic circles, I've seen people flop around on the floor, lay, you know, fall down, 
the slain in the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, and people sit back and they say, I don't think that's God. I can tell you, I flopped around like a fish a couple of times. <laughs> and I'm not really, you know, I'm not the type of guy to just flop around like a fish, if, in case you don't know me very well. <laughs> Listen, if, if God knocks you down on the floor and you don't get up any different than you went down, then I'll question whether or not it was God. But if God lays you out, I mean, it's just like John in the book of Revelation, when he sees Jesus, he says, I fell down as though I was dead. When Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus utters the word, I am, which is the name of God that God spoke to Moses. Jesus says, I am. It says that the soldiers who came to arrest him fell down as though they were dead. So if God knocks you down on the ground, man, go down. Don't, get, don't wait for the second hit. The first hit would be good enough. If God knocks you down on the ground, you go down. But listen, if you come up unchanged, undifferent, then I'll say it probably wasn't God, it was probably you. But if God knocks you down on the ground, man, and you have an experience with Him down there on the ground, and you come up and something about you has changed, and something about you is different, that was God. But God is doing these things in our life so that we'll be different when we leave that experience. Jacob wrestled with God and said, I'm not going to let you go until you touch me. And what does God do? He touches him in the hip socket. And Jacob walks with a limp for the rest of his life, an indicator that he was touched by God and that the walk of his life was forever changed. So don't seek God for goosebumps. Don't seek God for just feel-good experiences. Seek God so that He changes you. He changes your heart. He changes your life. He puts the Holy Spirit inside of you so that you can leave that place and you can go and change the world around you. That was a really good spot to like shout amen. But I have to get that amen sign out again. It's all right. Come on, are you guys with me? Is this making sense? Sodom, the most wicked city in all the Old Testament, but God, Jesus says if signs and wonders would have been performed in Sodom, they would have repented. Showing us that the working of the Holy Spirit through the church is the transformation, the agent of transformation that brings change to the world around us. I was driving down the road years ago. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. It was, it was so clear. And he asked me a question. He said, if an unbelieving spouse can sanctify a household, then what does the church do for its city? And I was like, that's a question, God. I just, like, wow. It's like when God came to Ezekiel and said, hey, can these dry bones live? I, I don't know, God, you know. It's like one of those questions. If an unbelieving spouse can sanctify an entire household, what can a church do for its city? See, come on, can we, can we be honest and say our perspective about church, our lens about church needs to be changed? For far too long, we, I just took the boys way over in, on the other side of Tyrone, and we go past this church, it was an old church, and on the front of it, it says the name of its church, and Built in 1899. Like, that's amazing. I, I love that. But that little church by itself would have fit into this room. And I'm going past this church built in 1899. And I'm thinking to myself in my head, I'm thinking, wow, that's really cool. That's really amazing. That's really old. And then the thought hits me. As soon as I start thinking something good about the church, the thought hits me. And I'm not saying there's anything bad about the church, but the thought hits me. The thought hits me. It's been there since 1899, and it's still exactly the same size. Are you kidding me? And we're building monuments to churches that have been here for hundreds of years, but are completely dead. And what's the problem? The problem is we've got our eyes off the goal. The problem is we've got our eyes off the prize. And church became about us and how we feel and what we want. The songs we want to sing. The messages we want to hear. 
And then we're going to silence the children and we're not going to teach them anything about the Holy Spirit. And what happens? The church just grows older and older and older and older till the last person finally dies and then the church is gone and they build a monument to it and put the year that it was built and all the while, there's nothing inside. Now that's good preaching, but it's also probably the saddest story I've ever heard in my life. Because that's not the church of Jesus Christ. The church is supposed to grow. We're supposed to go from glory to glory and faith to faith. We're supposed to increase. It's not just about building mega churches, but I will tell you this, that Jesus himself led a mega church. That the apostles in the New Testament church, it was a mega church. And it's not because of the size of the people, it was because of the amount of people that they were reaching. God asked me the question, if an unbelieving spouse sanctifies a household, what does the church do for its city? And I had to think, and I thought for a long time, and I came back with an answer. I said, Lord, I suppose that the church does the same thing for the city that the believing spouse does for the household. <laughs> See, because we have a judgmental view of God, we believe that sinners are deserving of death, deserving of judgment, deserving of hell. And we don't realize that God put us here to allow the sanctification that rests upon us. In other words, if you're not sanctified, the blessing and the favor of God cannot be applied to your life. To allow the sanctification that rests upon us to be superimposed on the city and the culture around us. In other words, because we are here, the people of God and the favor and the blessing of God is coming upon us it's actually transferable to the city and the region that we live in. Let me show you. In Daniel chapter 4. It's amazing. The entire, the entire Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. How many of you believe that? But do you know that there is one chapter in the Old Testament that was not written by a Jew, by an Israelite? As a matter of fact, there's one chapter in the Old Testament that was actually written by somebody who is outside of a relationship with God. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar writes in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel is transcribing the words of the king, and it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs! How mighty His wonders! His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is from generation to generation. The words of Nebuchadnezzar, an unbelieving king, over a nation who encounters the living God and the signs and wonders of that God and it causes his heart to turn and transform. Because this is the purpose of God's signs and wonders in the earth. To transform the hearts of men and women. The church sanctifies cities so that the demonstration of the kingdom of God can come and land on that city. So that the signs and wonders that exist within the heart of every spirit-filled believer is available to all who live in that city. It's just like Philip when he goes down to Samaria and preaches Christ to them. It says the entire city was filled with joy. The signs and wonders that followed Philip as demons were cast out, as people were healed, the end result that was, was that joy was poured out upon a city because one believer chose to go and allow the blessing and the favor of the Lord that it rested upon him to rest upon that city. Come on, guys. America is not lost. You want to know why? Because we're here. One Christian in Christ is a majority. And even a little church in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania 
is a majority in the realm of the Spirit. Now, there's a whole lot of other churches out there besides us, thankfully. And I believe our best days are ahead of us. Not just for America, but for the church. Because if the best days of the church are not ahead of us, then let's be honest, the best days of America are already behind us. But as the church progresses, as the church declares the gospel of the kingdom, as the church produces the power of the Holy Spirit, and as signs and wonders flow out of the ministry of the church, we will see cities and nations and kings transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? All right, I'm a long-winded preacher, but I'm almost done, I promise you. Acts chapter 14. This is my last scripture. And verse 3. It says, therefore, they stayed there for a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who is bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders be done by their hands. Skip down to verse number eight. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And the man leaped and walked. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lacedonian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. This is such a powerful scripture. And we understand that their theology was wrong. Paul and his companions were not gods. But their experience was right on. When Paul and his companions heal the man and a sign and a wonder from God comes, because these uh, unsaved, unbelieving people don't know anything about Jesus or about God, all they can say is the gods have come down and here they are and they just did something amazing. But Paul corrects them and he lets them know this did not come from us. This came from the real God, the true God, this came from the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you've just experienced a sign and a wonder that has transformed your heart. The sign and the wonder, it makes them wonder, but it points to Jesus. Come on, what did what did Paul say in in the book of Romans? He said, from one city to another, I have in mighty signs and wonders, I have fully preached the gospel. Paul pairs signs and wonders with the preaching of the gospel because the two go hand in hand. Just as you've seen right here in Acts chapter 14. In the book of Hebrews, it says that God granted signs and wonders as the word was preached in order to confirm the word. Signs and wonders confirm the word of God. Signs and wonders point us to an all-powerful God. Signs and wonders are the transforming agent that God has placed into the hands of the church through the person of the Holy Spirit. Years ago, Chris and I would take the kids to Lowe's when we lived in West Virginia to Parkersburg. It was just down the road from us. And we would, on Saturday mornings, they had a little building thing you took your kids in there and they would build a little car or a boat or whatever on Saturdays and and we would take them there often and there was a man there his name was John and he was always the one giving the kids the gifts and or not the gift but the crafts and helping them and leading them and John was a great guy real nice guy but he was he was like a Harley guy you know John had a long ponytail big beard kind of a little bit bigger guy and just a little rough around the edges but he was great with kids and he was very nice and we would talk to him we got to know him and then as we have always over the last 27 years of my life we were always working on houses actually we've only been married for 20 but the house things feels like 27 
I can't get out of it for some reason. So we're always going to Lowe's, and every time I would go to Lowe's, John would be there to help us. Well, John's not saved. John doesn't know Jesus. And we were always, you know, very polite, gracious, and thankful. And one day we take our kids on a Saturday morning into Lowe's, and we go back, and there's all kinds of families back there, and there's kids already building, and there's John. And this day, John is hunched over. He's got bandages on his arm. He looks like he's two heartbeats away from death. And I walk up to him. I say, John, what is wrong? Like, you don't look good. And he said, no, I was just in a motorcycle accident two days ago. I was like, what are you doing at work? And he said, I have to work. I don't have any choice. And he told me the story. He's sitting at a, at a red light and a lady, he's sitting in a red light. A lady's coming up behind him 35 miles an hour. She doesn't see the light. And she, at 35 miles an hour, hits the back of his motorcycle. He said, when I went into the air, he said, I saw the top of the red lights as I was launched into the air. I was like, what are you doing at work? Like, I have to be here. I've got bills to pay. I've got things I, I, I can't miss work. And man, my heart broke for him. And so we took our stuff and we went over to the corner. And I would like to tell you I'm the, like the superhero praying for people kind of guy. But they're like, it, it's not always easy. And some of you know what I'm talking about. But it was like, if I pass this one up, I'm not even a Christian. <laughs> like, I just, I'll just qualify myself. So we go over, the kids build their little thing. We take it, we take the tools back over. And I was like, hey, John, listen, can I just pray for you real quick? And he's like, oh, yeah, please. So I pray for him. Listen, honestly, I grab his hand. It's, it's a five second prayer. Jesus, be with John, heal his body, give him strength to work today. And then I left. And that was it. And probably a couple months go by, and we would go back into Lowe's from time to time. I didn't see John. I didn't know what happened to him. But one day I go back in, and there's John, and he's in the electrical aisle, and I'm getting something from there. And John is with another customer, and he's helping this other customer out. And I'm looking at all the stuff in the electrical aisle, and I see John there. And John leaves the guy that he's with and comes over to me. And John says, hey, listen, I've got to tell you something. He said, I haven't seen you in a while, but I have to tell you something. He said, when you prayed for me that day, he said, I, I don't go to church. I don't know anything about God. But when you prayed for me that day and you left, he said, I looked up to the ceiling and all of a sudden it was like I had stepped out of the building and the sun was so bright and shiny that it blinded my eyes for a moment. And he said, a few moments later, I felt something come down on the top of my head and it went all the way down to the bottom of my feet. And when it stopped, I was completely fine and had no pain in my body. See, that's a sign and a wonder. I didn't even know God would do it. I just released to the best of my ability what I felt like I had for John and God came through the rest of the way. But see, John to this day, has to live with the fact that he experienced something that was unusual, unnatural, and pointed him in the direction of Jesus. I don't know if John saved. I don't know whatever happened to him. But what I do know is that John that day had an encounter with a sign and a wonder through the power of the Holy Spirit that I pray has forever impacted and changed his life. And I've preached a long message and a loud message and I don't know if you understood all of it, but my hope and my encouragement to you is allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Allow the person of the Holy Spirit to minister through you. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? It's simple. You just ask. God, fill me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with power. Not for myself, Lord but so that I can be an agent for you. I can transform the world around me. I can go into all the world and preach your gospel to every creature. And I know that if you're with me and I believe that I will see the sick healed, I will see the captive set free. I will see deliverance come. And I will see cities and nations changed. 
it seems like a big message, you guys. But listen, it's exactly what was happening all through the book of Acts. It wasn't just that they were touching people. They were touching cities. And those cities were being transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand? Come on, the days of dead old religion. (laughs) My goodness. Let it be behind us. The days of powerless, no experience, no presence of God. Come on, let it be behind us. God is looking for a group of people that will partner with Him. God's looking for a person that will partner with the person of the Holy Spirit that will allow the Holy Spirit to move through their life, to change them so that they can go and change the world around them. Father, we just thank you today. Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done for us at the cross that you have sanctified us, Lord, that you have made us clean, you've made us holy, Lord. And Father, today, we recognize that you have more for us than just heaven, than just salvation. Lord, you have a ministry for us. And that through the person of Holy Spirit, Lord, you have empowered us to fulfill that mission, to fulfill that ministry. And so, Lord, today I pray for every person that's in this room and every person that's listening. Father, I pray that you would stir up a hunger inside of us. Lord, that we would desire the Holy Spirit in our lives more than we've ever had before. Lord, regardless of how long we've been saved, regardless of what we've seen, what we've experienced to this point, Father, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in a transforming and even more powerful and more dynamic way than you ever have before. Lord, fill us to overflowing. Fill us with your power, Lord. Fill us with your fire. Fill us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. And use us, God to transform the world around us. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Come on, can you just pray that with me today? Lord, fill me. Fill me, God. Fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit today. Fill me to overflowing, Lord. Give me more, Jesus. More of you, God. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, remove everything that hinders, every weight that entangles, so that we can run this race with perseverance. Lord, help us to keep our eyes upon you, the author and finish of our of our faith. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on the goal, the prize. Lord, help us to understand that Christianity wasn't just about us. Lord, it was all about you. And about you using us to reach the world around us. So we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, if that's you today, just as a, a, as a sign of commitment, Lord, use me. Fill me more. Use me, God. That you just lift up your hand right now. Let's just pray. God, use us. Use us, Lord. Father, I ask for your anointing to fall upon every person that has their hand raised right now. Lord, I ask you for your power, your anointing to rest upon them. Lord, that they would go forth and do great exploits in the name of the Lord. Father, I thank you that in this room there are people who will see blind eyes open, there are people who will see. 
lame, the lame walk, Lord. There are people who will see deaf ears open in Jesus' name. Lord, that nothing is impossible for those that believe. So Father, I ask you today for your anointing to rest upon us, Lord. That you would increase our faith. That you would increase our expectation. And God, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. More of you, Jesus. More of you. Thank you, Jesus. God, you're so good. You're so good, Lord. Father, we just thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you need prayer before you go today, we want to pray for you. Maybe you're here today and You just want somebody to agree with you on things that you're facing. We want to give you time to be ministered to today. Thank you, Lord. Come on, God's good. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. If you need prayer, Make your way forward. Let us minister to you today. But it's been so good to have you. God be with you. God bless you and let the power of the Holy Spirit flow through your life. Amen.